Hello everyone and welcome to today's IIED debates event hosted uh, with E3G, uh, a green recovery for inclusion, debt relief and SDRs for climate action. Hope you're feeling uh, relaxed and ready to hear from the fantastic panel that we have here with us today. My name is Juliet and I'm the events officer at IIED and providing te technical support during um, this event. Without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Andrew Norton, IID Director and our moderator for today's session. Andy, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Juliet, and welcome, everybody. It's a huge pleasure to be here with a, a really great panel for today's discussion. Um, in the hour ahead of us, we want to explore together what is needed to support growing initiatives to improve debt management, particularly for um, countries which are highly vulnerable, both in terms of climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, um, the pandemic situation and debt burdens. And we want to put a particular focus on the role of debt relief and um, also the IMS special drawing rights, SDRs, um, with there's been a lot of discussion of a new issuance of those um, somewhere between 500 and 650 billion for climate and nature action. We know that the burden of debt on low and middle income countries has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. We know also that that burden of debt was increasing before the pandemic. If you look at the data between um, say uh, 2010, 2014 and 2015, 2019, there's a sharp uptick in debt burdens across low income countries and also uh, low middle income countries as well. So, and on top of that, you have the impacts of the pandemic. Research from IID and E3G has shown that as well as hampering a possible economic recovery, this debt distress also constrains the abilities of countries to cope with the impacts of climate change and indeed to implement their own programs to mitigate climate change as well. The urgency for climate finance to mitigate the catastrophic climate and nature induced damage continues. Um, we're continuing to see shocking impacts of climate change all over the world. Um, some of the recent headlines, which are particularly striking, the hot season in Karachi, which is always difficult for everybody in Pakistan, happening earlier than it was supposed to start um, and with temperatures well above 40 degrees and on an extended basis, that's really, really difficult conditions to work, live and survive in. And also I'm sure many of you will have seen um, the coverage of the extraordinary heat dome in the Pacific Northwest of the Americas, um, the mountain village of Lytton in Canada, reached a record of 49.6 cent centigrade that exceeded way by a huge margin the predictions of previous climate models. I think what's really catching people's attention with this isn't just that it's a new heat record, we're used to seeing those. Um, it's the level at which it bust the previous heat record for that area by 4.6 degrees centigrade, which really is extraordinary. So there is this sense of an accelerating climate crisis um, that it's essential that we find every means possible to respond to and particularly to help vulnerable countries to develop their own responses. At this critical moment, therefore, we need finance availability to be upscaled for climate action and for combating biodiversity loss. Um, and we need new initiatives to build resilience and help countries develop their adaptive capacity. The principles of debt management for nature and climate outcomes is gaining traction as a way to relieve debt distress on low and middle income countries and to increase the spending on these objectives around protecting the, um, protecting the natural world, but also enabling human societies to cope with the, the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss. There is growing attention being focused also, as I mentioned earlier, on the reallocation of special drawing rights via the IMF as an avenue that can propel a green recovery to the pandemic and indeed also possibly be used uh, for um, doing something to have more equality, more equity in the rollout of vaccines globally, which currently is appallingly inequitable. 
um, with rich countries having far more um, access and in many, many cases being able to um, protect their populations many times over while uh, poor countries really struggle for access. I think less than 1% of all uh, vaccines delivered in the world have been delivered in Africa and that figure is not getting any better. So with the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting starting on Friday, our panel today will explore these key issues and what would be needed to achieve a global debt initiative for climate and nature and for an equitable recovery to the global pandemic. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce our great panel for today. Um, it's a real honor to have with us uh, Flavien P. Joubert, who is the Minister for Agriculture, Climate Change and the Environment in the Seychelles. He has worked in the Ministry of Environment for over 24 years and has held and served in several key posts. In 2016, the Republic of Seychelles agreed to protect a third of its marine and coastal area in exchange for a reduction of its debt in the first ever climate adaptation debt swap, which converted debt into investments in coastal protection and adaptation. And we're really looking forward, Minister, to hearing about this experience later. I'm also delighted to welcome Jeremy Zettermeyer, who is the Deputy Director in the Strategy, Policy and Review Department um, of the IMF and has been there since August 2019. He has held positions at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, the German Ministry for Economic Affairs, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and he has published in major economic journals, and is co-author of Debt Defaults and Lessons from a Decade of Crises, a study of sovereign debt crises during the 1990s and 2000s. You're very welcome, Jeremy. We're delighted you can join us. And um, our final panelist is Laura, my colleague, Laura Kelly, who is the director of IID's Shaping Sustainable Markets Group, um, who, the, a work that supports uh, work on inclusive and green economies as its core mission. So to kick off, I'd like to invite my colleague, Laura, uh, to the floor to set the scene with an overview of debt management and, and the use of special drawing rights, SDRs, for climate and nature. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Andy, and hello, everyone. Um, possibly, uh, like you, I would quite like to be on my way to Venice to participate in the um, climate uh, summit there with finance ministers to discuss these really important issues. But um, like many of us, we are stuck at home um, working remotely still. Um, but I'm very pleased to be in such distinguished and knowledgeable company to talk about the issues, and I hope um, we will be trying to send a message from this discussion today uh, about what the, the, the G20 should be doing in Venice. So to start off to outline some of the work that IID has been doing in this space, I'll just set up sharing my screen. Hopefully everybody can see that okay. So this is work that we've been doing for about um, six months now, and it started looking at that debt crisis that, that, that Andy first mentioned. And the issues that we have of debt, climate change and biodiversity. And climate change and biodiversity are very much on the agenda this year. There's the Climate COP in Glasgow in November and the Kunming Biodiversity Summit. Sorry, my, it's be getting ahead of itself. Um, We've seen the high temperatures, we've seen uh, loss of biodiversity. And one of the key things is that we need finance, we need investment in both climate mitigation and um, protecting uh, forests, protecting um, species. And debt is creating a problem for that kind of uh, investment that uh, along with COVID, many countries, particularly poor or lower income countries do not have that resource available. And here, as Andy was saying, is a set of um, uh, data going back to the 1960s showing uh, the increasing levels of debt that uh, low income countries are holding. And I think one of the most interesting things about this is how the composition of that debt is changing. It's no longer just with the bilateral creditors, the so-called Paris Club. 
it's predominantly now mm. with private sector creditors. And we're also seeing those private sector investors talking now a lot about net zero investment strategies, wanting to make their portfolios climate neutral. So we see that there's an opportunity to target those private sector creditors as well to increase resources available for climate and nature. So moving on to this work that we've been doing, which we term debt management for climate and nature. The idea is that the creditor allows the debt to be managed in a number of ways by converting to local currency, to being paid at a lower interest rate, or for there to be a debt write-off, and then new debt instruments, such as performance bonds, that would target nature and climate investments. And that these investments would be pro poor So we want to see inclusive green recovery. Climate resilience is an area, green jobs in renewable energy, in mangrove rehabilitation. There's potential there to create opportunities for employment, particularly for poorer groups, and particularly for groups who may have suffered as a result of COVID, people who may, who may have lost jobs, whose livelihoods may have been undermined. So how could you actually try to do that in practice? We've been working um, on a project with funding from the Marva Foundation in West Africa, looking at a number of countries uh, such as Cabo Verde and Senegal, where they've got significant biodiversity and climate challenges, but they're, they're very interested in finding ways to increase resources for investment there and leveraging their debt to do that. Um, past debt swaps, as they've been called, have been much sort of smaller um, types of projects. And we'll be hearing more about the Senegal, sorry, the Senegal, Seychelles experience in, in a moment. Um, but often they've been trust funds managed by international NGOs. What's the potential to learn from those and potential shift to more systematic programs um, where money is channeled through budget systems uh, and it helps to, to build the sort of fiduciary standards and, and government's own capacity. But in terms of setting this up, we have to identify what are the key targets that want to identify that not only are agreed by the international community and by governments, but actually have a sense of local ownership. A lot of IID's work focuses on local participation and solutions that really work for, for local people. And the advantage of, of the, this approach would be that it would allow larger amounts of funds to be liberated in investment. Uh, it would increase um, government ownership and it also increases accountability uh, to national citizens. How does this then link to this issue of special drawing rights that we're hearing so much about at the moment? As Andy said, there's up to about 650 billion of SDRs um, could be issued soon. There's the potential that these are basically controlled by the, the, the developed, the wealthier countries, the potential to reallocate these to developing countries and to use for vaccines, as we've been hearing, to address that vaccine inequality, but also for this sort of green and inclusive recovery. Uh, and particularly with the Kunming and Glasgow COPs to actually demonstrate more financing being made available for these priorities. So what are the things that those um, finance ministers uh, and G20 officials heading to Venice, what should they be thinking about? The next steps that we've outlined are potentially uh, a highly indebted uh, country's um, climate and nature initiative, a, a, a Hicken uh, initiative, as we've, we, we've termed it. Um, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, OECD have set up a platform to look into these issues. So that, that's an opportunity for the G20 to, to support that uh, and to, to, to provide us a, a, a stimulus for it to go forward. And particularly for pilot countries to, to take that are interested in this idea, such as small island developing states, Barbados, Grenada, Cabo Verde, to actually take that forward so G20 finance ministers could, could commit resources to support that. Also, the G20 could send a very strong message to those creditors, particularly the private creditors and China, to join this initiative. The G20 debt suspension initiative um, has made some progress, but it, it's had very little participation, if any, from the private sector and relatively little engagement from China. Mobilizing those uh, special drawing rights, putting some of those um, 
drawing rights to support the, the, the platform. And then actually developing a, a commitment to this, so a memorandum of understanding um, under the Italian presidency to ensure that things do go forward. So the communique that comes out of the G20, we hope will be much more robust and say some more concrete things that will help to move this agenda forward than the reasonably good start a couple of weeks ago in Cornwall. Thanks, Andy. Thanks very much indeed, Laura. Um, Jeremy, um, it would be great to get your reflections on what you think would be needed to achieve a global debt initiative for climate and nature, and also to stimulate an inclusive and green pandemic recovery, um, particularly in vulnerable countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Andrew. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, so first of all, um, we, we fully agree that the climate and biodiversity crisis are urgent and must be tackled with all available instruments. And we also agree that those instruments in, in principle uh, should include uh, some form of conditional debt relief uh, as well as uh, uh, reallocated or rechanneled uh, SDRs. Uh, now, on, on the specifics, um, so the, the way we would think about debt relief in connection with climate and nature uh, is not, not so much as an instrument to solve a debt crisis, but as an instrument to help solve a climate and uh, biodiversity crisis. Uh, so the distinction is, is important because sometimes debt swaps particularly are oversold as an instrument that can tackle everything uh, at the time, and that, that is not necessarily the case. So if we have countries that have plainly unsustainable debts, those countries need relief just to get back on their feet, even before thinking about climate action. Uh, nonetheless, the reason why uh, I think reflecting on uh, uh, conditional debt relief, debt swaps, if you like, in a broad sense, uh, as part of our response uh, to the climate and uh, biodiversity crisis is, is fair game, is the lack of resources problem that uh, Laura mentioned uh, at, at the beginning. So I think, you know, in, in principle, the model that maybe many had in mind uh, when it comes to where resources are uh, take a form of loans, you know, possibly very low interest loans, but not necessarily of transfers or, or debt relief, grants or debt relief. Now, this works for some countries, namely the, the fiscal strength uh, to repay them but it doesn't work for other countries, right? And that, that may have different reasons. It may have, one of the reasons may be that they have very little fiscal space because of pre-existing debts. But another equally important reason is that uh, the, cli uh, the climate problem may itself be generating a debt problem, right? So that, that is uh, the case, for example, when you have uh, uh, small islands that are really in their existence by, uh, by the climate crisis. Uh, and so for these uh, cases, uh, adaptation investments might be the only way to survive. And from a debt sustainability, uh, sustainability point, they might be the wise. But even after, debt might still be unsustainable. Right? So that is essentially the logic for debt relief in connection with the climate and, and nature crisis. Now, in, in principle, of course, it doesn't matter whether the, if you like, direct fiscal support that such countries need takes the form of debt relief or just of grants, right? So these are equivalent instruments. And so, you know, as an institution, I think we would take an agnostic view on how the fiscal support is delivered, uh, as long as it, it is not delivered in the form of loans that countries cannot repay. So for, for me personally, the question, you know, should this be debt relief, should this be grants is, is fundamentally a political question, whatever works uh, better. And so one thing to bear in mind here is that when you focus on 
debt relief only, uh, as opposed to grants, uh, you are, in a sense, starting uh, with the distribution of debt claims as it exists now, right? So the donors, if you wish, are the existing creditors. Uh, and um, not all countries or organizations that might be willing uh, to provide fiscal support are also countries or organizations that hold lots of claims. So the fact that the distribution Um, to low-income countries is extremely concentrated in the hands of just a few large creditors might be a, a, a global debt uh, initiative. So, so, so bear this uh, in mind. So uh, answering the question, you know, what is needed to achieve such a global de debt uh, relief interest uh, initiative? So there, there is obviously a whole range of issues. You know, we, we the, the most uh, uh, obvious one, which Uh, Laura touched on is that uh, debt swaps have a bad name because they uh, typically um, uh, were associated with very high transactions of scale. So the scalability of this instrument is, is an issue. Uh, so there, there would need to be some form of addressing this. Laura has, has put out some ideas of how to, how to do that. Um, there is, uh, of course, uh, in of country ownership. So, you know, they, these are, uh, this is conditional debt relief. Uh, so in, in some sense, the, the creditor imposes its ideas on what to do with the freed up funds on the uh, debtor country. And this usually only works if the debtor country agrees, right? So that there is an issue there. But, you know, most fundamentally, I think the issue is one of coordination across particularly official creditors, not all of which may support this. And that has to do partly with what I stated before, namely that uh, debt relief is, is very concentrated in some countries, um, giving those, I'm sorry, debt claims are concentrated um, in, in, by, you know, in the hands of some creditors. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, make, making, you know, in a, a coordination across a a group of countries that all want to have a say more difficult. And of course, there's the general coordination problem, which is that, as always, when you have debt relief, the, the benefits of debt relief go um, uh, to are shared by, by all creditors who's, uh, who are you know, more likely to get their money back uh, if the country is solvent. And in this case, who may also have uh, direct or indirect benefits from the effects or biodiversity effects of such debt relief but there is a free riders problem, right? So it is in each creditor's interest to have the others uh, pay for this and then um, just um, enjoy the benefits. And, and so the, this is a coordination issue that has to be solved at 20 level. Uh, and at this level, we've done a lot and tried a lot and there is a, a lot of political will, but Uh, even the debt relief initiatives that have been agreed by the G20 um, are hard work. Uh, and the political willingness uh, to entertain yet another debt relief uh, initiative, this one focused on climate and biodiversity, may, may be limited. So, so that is the main uh, uh, problem. Uh, and of course, you know, you, uh, the NGOs and the think tanks, you can contribute to solving uh, this problem by the case. Uh, okay, uh, then let me get yes, the ask be reallocated to support climate vulnerable countries. Well, I mean, fun fundamentally, there are two ways uh, to, to do this. Uh, the one is to uh, reallocate them. Uh, so, so that, I mean, technically, the, the, how the The way this works is that, you know, countries receive, would receive, if, if it is approved by the Board of Governors of the IMF, as we expect it to be, uh, probably in August, a general SDR allocation. And then the, these countries are free to do with this uh, SDR allocation, which is essentially a, a right to draw a cheap lending from the other uh, countries uh, in hard currency. They, they can do anything they want. With these, and so one thing they can do, in particular, is they could on-lend their SDRs 
uh, organizations uh, or a trust uh, that in turn lends them uh, countries uh, to data countries for a specific firm. So, so one option would be to do this on lending to multilateral development banks, strengthen their ability to do climate funding. So that is an option that is being explored. Uh, another option could be to uh, create a, a new trust of some form. So this is being managed, mentioned by uh, my managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, uh, uh, under the name Resilience ST. And so this would be, if you like, a dedicated pot of money that would top up IMF supported programs of countries to enable them to um, finance uh, and, and investments. Now, if one goes the second route, so this trust route, there's one difficulty that you have to bear in mind, which is that this has to be, in a sense, covered by the legal constraints on IMF lending. And so one, uh, the most important such constraint is that we lend uh, to countries in order to help them deal with a temporary balance of payments need. Now, I make the argument, I think in my personal view, you can easily make the argument that large scale climate related investments create such a temporary balance of payment, need, which would justify drawing on, on such a trust. But what one thing that a trust like this cannot do is project finance. So it cannot, if you like, earmark this money to a specific project and then put conditionality you know, send IMF staff out there to check whether they use the rent and that sort of thing, right? The IMF is not to its, its charter. So conditionality associated with this type of trust would have to be policy conditionality. And policy conditionality in the climate area, of course, for the most part, not entirely, refers to mitigation, uh, less to adaptation. Uh, so for example, subsidy reform. So, so those are, uh, let me stop here. Thank you very much indeed, Jeremy. That was fascinating. I'm sure there'll be questions from the audience in due course, but let me move at this point uh, to Minister Joubert. It's a huge um, honor to have you with us. Um, can I just ask you first, Minister, to reflect on the Seychelles debt for climate swap that I mentioned earlier. How successful do you think that's been? And can you give us some idea how the environmental performance of that instrument was monitored. Okay, thank you for, for having me. Um, I think as uh, you all know, Seychelles restructured, uh, converted actually its debt, 21.6 million of uh, sovereign debt in 2015 that was done. And uh, the whole um, process was uh, facilitated by the Nature Conservancy, Nature Vest, an arm of the of TNC. And uh, the a trust was set up, the Seychelles Climate Adaptation Trust uh, was set up around that time. And this trust is actually overseen by a, a board of trustees, which comprises eight persons. And the trust uh, will use the Seychelles debt payments to repay the initial capital that was raised, and also to fund ongoing marine, marine conservation uh, and climate adaptation activities. And uh, just to, to uh, go into some of the details, the trust itself, what it's supposed to do is to eventually repay 15.2 million of the loan from TNC uh, at 3% over 10 years, and then also disburse 250. 280,000 USD over 20 years in local currency. And that's going to be used for marine conservation and climate adaptation activities, and also invest 150,000 USD per year over 20 years to an endowment fund, uh, endowment fund for future uh, climate change and also uh, conservation programming. So for us, uh, from the, the Seychelles side, um, the trust has been set up. The uh, uh, trust fund itself is uh, already uh, providing facilities for different activities um, in the country. And uh, it is um, al already delivering some results for us. Um, for example, just to go over some of the, the things that it's, do it's doing. 
So it's actually providing alternative uh, funding to the NGO sector that otherwise would depend on, for example, corporate social responsibility or uh, would have to fight over whatever amount of financing we can get from the from external sources. And uh, it's also, uh, the trust fund is also supporting research and uptake of sustainable aquaculture, for example, to protect livelihoods and food security. And also it's supporting uh, into, into small entrepreneurs and small businesses that seek to diversify their business and enter into blue economic activity, blue economy activities. So um, for Seychelles, we see that the trust fund, the whole uh, proposal, the whole uh, scheme has worked and it's, uh, it's delivering on some of the results. And uh, crucially, it's uh, providing a lot of space for people and groups who would like to get involved in, in conservation and in climate adaptation activities to actually get on with the different activities and move faster than we, than we would have if we were just depending on external finance. So uh, I would say it is it has been a success for Seychelles, but um, of course um, this is not a, a solution for all of our debt. This is only part of the debt. And uh, now with COVID, and uh, especially with the downturn, the sharp downturn in tourism in the country, um, the country has suffered quite a bit, and the debt to GDP ratio has gone up sharply, and um, so we, we, we are faced once again with uh, dealing with the future when it comes to climate and biodiversity loss and uh, coming out of COVID at the same time. And also we are faced with a sharp, a sharp uh, increase in the debt, debt to GDP. Seychelles was on track to uh, have a 70% debt to GDP ratio around this time, uh, 2020, 2021. But uh, suddenly we find ourselves with a much higher ratio and that is uh, an issue for the country. So we have to go back and maybe have another, another look at uh, what is possible. And I think the proposal uh, that is being uh, put on the table, that is being uh, debated around using the, the, S, the special drawing rights, I think it's in the right direction. It should, uh, it could be, an additional lifeline for small islands and, and countries that are uh, that face this uh, debt distress and that uh, face increasing debt uh, burden. And uh, I think he, I would urge uh, all our partners on the outside, especially. Uh, but now we're talking to the G20 and the the major lenders of this uh, of this world. Um, I would urge them to take a look at those options because for us, uh, as a high income developing country, um, I think, you know, the, the usual story of when you, when you become a high income developing country, you uh, have access to a smaller, uh, gradually you get uh, squeezed, or not, not squeezed, but rather the access to financing is, is rather limited. And uh, I think for countries like us, it would be important to have other options on the table like what like the previous presenter mentioned. So uh, I think it's a, it's a step in the right direction. And I think it's something that we should uh, continue, continue to explore and uh, develop over time. And uh, hopefully in the near future, I'll be able to offer that to, to some of the, the countries in the same situation as each other. So thank you. Minister, thank you very much indeed. Can I just ask as a quick follow up? Um, as you explained, the Seychelles experience involved setting up an independent trust fund and working with the Nature Conservancy and so on. Um, in this context of COVID recovery and the urgency that that imposes, um, do you think that debt management instruments uh, such as this, uh, the funds could be usefully managed through, through the main government budget rather than by setting up an independent trust fund? Do you think that would be a good thing to consider at this point? Well, it depends on, uh, I think it would depend on the structure that you have in place and the, the capacity and the uh, demonstrated ability of the government itself to manage that, to manage those funds. Each government has its own system and uh, there are different, uh, different uh, metrics that measure the performance of different governments. But uh, currently the, 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 the trust fund that we have uh, has got uh, trustees who are looking after the funds and they are doing it in a sort of independent manner. 
And I would think that uh, whatever system we decide upon and whatever approach is taken, uh, there has to be this fiduciary oversight of uh, this uh, money. Uh, it cannot just be released into the government uh, uh, budget in a very general sense. There has to be oversight and very importantly, it has to be linked with performance indicators. So somebody has to be uh, tracking how uh, all the different indicators are, are being dealt with and how, uh, how far government is, uh, is taking steps to actually achieve the original goals of the, of the swap. So I think uh, at, the, at the outset, it's important to lay down all the ground rules. It's important to, to agree on the targets for the use of those resources. And it's important to agree on who should be uh, monitoring the uh, use of those funds. And I think if that's done, uh, we should find ourselves with something that is, uh, that is uh, acceptable, regardless of uh, whether it's uh, embedded within government or in a fund that is partially or 100% outside of government. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. That was really, really helpful. Um, and just a, a final quick question. Is this experience, the debt for nature swap, is this something that from a Seychelles perspective, you would encourage other climate vulnerable countries to develop or to look at these proposals? Well, I think um, the Seychelles experience has shown that um, um, we have to look at uh, all forms of financing in order to achieve uh, to achieve uh, certain targets when it comes to climate and better conservation. Um, uh, Seychelles, as we developed, we, as I mentioned, we were faced with the issue of uh, diminishing access to, to international funds. So we have to look at different options. And uh, this is one option. There might be other versions or similar, similar types of uh, financing that can uh, be brought to bear, that can be uh, put on the table. And I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important that we have a whole menu of options for countries that can actually help uh, us uh, do this, uh, I mean, uh, uh, get the right resources to, to do our adaptation. I mean, the Seychelles, we just completed our national determined contribution, but the main issue with the, with the NDC, uh, I think as you all know, and also with the, with the NBSAP, with the Biodiversity Strategic Action Plan, is how do we finance activities under there? So uh, I think the most important thing is to have a whole menu of options on the table, uh, grant financing uh, and uh, private financing, blended finance, everything. And then which can give you a certain level of guarantee that you will be able to achieve uh, a significant amount of those uh, objectives that you set up to, to achieve. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. And thank you, Jeremy. Uh, let me go now for some of the questions that have come in from the audience. This one is from Graham Gordon. And I, th I think it's, I'm gonna direct it to you, Jeremy, in initially. Um, the question is, how can we ensure that any new climate finance, in particular from SDRs, is given in, as grants and not loans so that it does not add to the problematic debts of poor and climate vulnerable countries? Uh, so the answer is we can't. Uh, so anything coming from SDRs is by definition loans, not grants. Uh, and the reason for that is that SDRs are given to the member countries of the IMF um, as a form of international reserves. They are typically uh, uh, maintained uh, by central banks. And these central banks are typically legally barred to just give away the SDRs without a budgetary uh, allocation. And, and so, you know, while in principle, SDRs could be given away and then the central bank could be compensated from the uh, government budget, this would not have any advantage over simply the government budget doing a, a straight grant. So the, the, the nice thing about SDR, uh, the SDR allocation, the, the reason why uh, it, it is a source of uh, potentially of, of climate finance is that there are ways of on lending the SDRs that members receive in a way that preserves their character as international reserves from the perspective of the central banks that own these SDRs. So we can do this in a way that minimizes the credit risk, that maintains liquidity, 
and that enables those central banks to do it. So rather than just keeping it them in their vault, so to speak, they ought to lend them. They get paid a very low interest uh, rate on them. Uh, but, but that is the limit. So it has to be lending at a, a suitably low interest rate. So it is more favorable in terms of debt burdens. The way, there are ways of deploying it that are more favorable than the existing Yes, debt. indeed. Yes, indeed. I mean, the main advantage to, to pick up on uh, what Minister Joubert said is that something like a resilience uh, a, a, and sustainability trust would be accessible by middle income countries. So by what you know, Minister Joubert referred to as high, high income developing countries not at a zero interest rate, but at the SDR interest rates, which currently is almost zero. So it would provide a lending at more favorable terms than countries like the Seychelles, for example, can, can typically access to other fund facilities. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Laura, do you have any thoughts on the SDRs issue and this question of um, how it can really help, in, particularly in this moment of, of triple crisis. Yeah, I think it is this point of the additionality. I mean, we're not um, thinking at IID about this being in any way, um, you know, a contribution to say the, um, the $100 billion climate finance commitments that developed countries have made to support low income developing countries. And I think um, Minister Joubert, outlined very clearly the advantages for uh, a number of countries that are now classified as you know, higher income developing countries, but actually don't have access to um, concessional credit uh, lines from the, the IMF or from, from the bank and potentially are forced to, into um, the private credit market. And that's where con concessionality is likely to be much less, where some of the concerns, some countries that um, have expressed, um, you know, not wanting to go into debt restructuring because of how um, that might affect their market access and how they're viewed by private creditors, that actually adding this into the mix really increases the menu um, of, of resources that are available. And it is some of the countries, as, as um, Minister Joubert was saying, particularly climate vulnerable, particularly um, um, rich biodiversity that really do need access to these resources in some kind of concessional way. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Minister Joubert, uh, there's a question also about the relative balance of debt cancellation as against in instruments such as SDRs. That's from Gayla montesson -Claire. Um What's your thinking about the priorities as it looks from the perspective of the Seychelles, um, the advantages of the SDRs route versus the practicality and advantages of simple debt cancellation? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think uh, cancellation in itself is something that is everybody hopes for in life. So uh, for any country, I think that debt cancellation would be the, the absolutely best solution. But we all know how the world operates. We know that uh, uh, le uh, the lenders, at some point, they might actually desire getting back some of what they, they have lent out to different countries. So it's not always possible to get that cancellation. But I still think that um, in dealing with a particular country and in, in uh, uh, coming up with a, with a package, it would be good for the country, and because it does, it does uh, create a uh, relief for the country. It, it'd be good if, uh, in the negotiation, you can uh, you can agree on uh, SDR uh, re, uh, debt conversion, but also some cancellation. Uh, I think Seychelles, before it did the conversion, benefited from some debt cancellation at some point. Uh, I can't remember the exact date, but then after that. Uh, going further, you have to do this debt conversion. So uh, I would say that debt cancellation should be uh, in addition to debt conversion, which in total can give you a package that actually helps the country in a very big way. Just taking some of the debt and converting it might not be, uh, might not make a significant impact on the country itself and it uh, might not give you the, the desired result. So uh, in order for a country to bounce back, like we have COVID now, um, we do need relief that actually is 
significant, substantial, and that actually has an impact on the country. So some debt, debt cancellation to the extent possible, I think should be part of the package. And um, in considering a particular package for countries like Seychelles, uh, lenders might, might decide based on the history, on the economy and everything. But uh, yes, debt cancellation should be a part in the whole, in the whole uh, uh, scheme of things. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Jeremy, um, a quick question from me for you. We, we're seeing this figure, you know, 650 billion around the SDR's issuance. Um, and obviously there are a whole series of processes that will need to be gone through before um, the actual amount that could be realized for support to um, vulnerable countries would be determined. What's your thinking about the likely volumes that might be achievable through the SDR's issuance in practice? You, you mean the, um, the volumes that can be quote unquote rechanneled? Yes, through, that, that's it. Through, yeah. So we, we, don't, we don't know yet. It's, it's too early to say. I, I, I think they would be substantial, uh, but um, you know, bear, bear in mind that uh, something like the current uh, Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, and not, so not, don't nail me down on this number, okay, because I don't have it really in my head, but yeah, I think the ballpark, the ballpark is something like 10 billion. Right. Uh, uh, eight, I think 8 billion SDRs, possibly something like that, right? And right. this is the main vehicle uh, where we that we use to uh, to finance and, and by the way everyone can go on the IMS website and <laughs> check the correct number I may be quite off uh, so so uh, this is much lower I mean the point is to is that this is an order of magnitude lower than the total allocation and, and so even if we were to channel a relatively small amount of the total allocation into these trusts relative to the typical size of those trusts which are quite important it would be a big a big effect. Thank they're, you. Currently, they're, currently about, they're currently about somewhere between 18 and 20 countries or so that lend to the PRGT, right? The PRGT is already a trust that is based on rechanneled SDRs. And, and so we would think that maybe we'll get a similar number of rich countries that are willing to do this. Um, okay. Thank you very much for having a go at that. And we understand that this is unknowable at this point, but many thanks for having a go. Um, a question here from Kit Nicholson, um, and again, I think Minister Joubert, if I could channel this to you, um, the question is past budget support initiatives for climate change adaptation have struggled to define performance frameworks that reflect outcomes rather than activities. Um, is there an acceptance that um, specifying activities as the delivery framework will be sufficient to justify approval of debt relief. Do you, do you sense that that is possible given that the out, trying to specify outcomes is going to be a big challenge? Well, thank you for that, uh, for that question. Uh, it's always much more difficult to, to, to specify outcomes compared to activities themselves. Um, but I think to the extent possible, we should try and, and, and define the outcome even though uh, in some cases, we might not uh, reach the exact outcome within the time frame that the program is ongoing, but we should aim for a certain level of, of outcome and uh, try also to measure it. Uh, but uh, it, as a country, we've had a lot of experience with uh, activities, with defining uh, uh, programs in terms of activities, and I think that, that, that works very well. But uh, in my mind, I think we have to go further. Um, and uh, over time, uh, the different uh, groups and individuals who are involved in this uh, in these projects, in these programs, they should uh, try and define ways to actually measure outcomes. It's possible that uh, we have to extend the time frame. We have to look at uh, uh, ways to to actually gather information and uh, ways to report on the outcomes. But it is it is always necessary, I think, uh, especially when we talk about adaptation. When we're talking about uh, making up for loss of biodiversity, we have to aim for the bigger picture and for the for the bigger outcomes. Uh, that is the actually the the original intention of all those efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
And I think there's time for one more question, which I'd like to direct both to Jeremy and Laura. Um, this is again from Graham Gordon. Um, and it's asking about, given the limitations, both of volume and the nature of the delivery channel of the PRGT, he says, surely we need to think of new and other ways of channeling SDRs to tackling COVID and supporting a green recovery, e.g. directly to the Green Climate Fund and COVEX, et cetera. Um, Laura, do you want to have a go at that first? Sure. I was also just going to um, uh, follow up on um, the, the question about the, the KPIs. So I, I mentioned a project that we're doing currently in West Africa, um, and we've developed a, a methodology to try to really get at this issue of KPIs that are actually about outcomes rather than activities or, or outputs. And um, I can't do it with the tech at the moment, but um, if you'd like to go and take a look at our uh, website, if you look under the Debt Swaps project there, you'll see uh, we've published uh, a how-to note on that, but we do recognize that that's really important. So that's a slightly easier question to answer. Yeah. The more difficult one on new ways to, um, to channel SDRs. I mean, I think we've seen during the crisis um, these figures are probably a little bit out of date now from a couple of months ago, but um, it was estimated that around about $12 trillion of stimulus packages had been um, set out and only about 0.5% of that was from, from developing countries or for, for the least developed countries. So we have actually seen developed countries access huge amounts of finance. So I, I think that they're probably, we are at a bit of a, a tipping point of trying to do things differently. Um, I think the, the challenge with um, getting the IMF to do things differently is that it's the board of directors. So it, it is all of the, the, the key countries that have to agree. And that's why, you know, potentially G20 finance ministers uh, in Venice should not just be thinking about their own recoveries, but really thinking about the global recovery and the role that they can play in supporting countries, not just by providing finance, but by looking at the international architecture and seeing what changes. I'm not saying, you know, completely radical overhaul, but what are some of the kinds of things that could be done potentially shorter term to address the crisis um, that, that they, they could come up with? I'm not quite sure what exactly they would be, but I think that's the kind of spirit that we'd like to see. Thank you very much, Laura. And Jeremy, um, what would be your reaction to that um, in terms of a broader, more creative um, approach, either to using SDRs or finding other ways of channeling, um, channeling support at this point to vulnerable countries in the context of the, of the recovery from COVID? No, I'm, I'm uh, you know, completely in agreement that we must find new and creative ways to to channel support and indeed that that you know conditional debt relief should be uh, on the table. Uh, with respect to the SDR route, um, remember this is once the general allocation has happened, this is the money of our members, and and they are free to do anything they want with it. Now they, you know, could channel this money to the current PRGT, they could channel it to multilateral development banks, they could channel it to a new trust, they could channel it to the Green Climate Fund, possibly. But when, when you think of these channeling options, the important thing to bear in mind is that for, for the most part, this is money that is in the on the books of central banks that want to be able to treat these monies as international reserves. That is the fundamental constraint. And, and so this is why using IMF administered trusts is kind of a popular option because it enables us to structure these trusts in a way that meet the needs of these central banks. Whether the Green Climate Fund could do that, I don't know, right? Uh, maybe something worth exploring, but this is the reason why one is somewhat constrained when it comes to the use of these SDRs, right? The willingness of these countries to unlend these SDRs, the reason why, you know, sometimes this is viewed as a windfall is because, you know, the, from the perspective of these central banks, they, they say to themselves, look, these are just reserves on our books. Whether these reserves are used for a different purpose, why we don't need them, is of no concern to us, provided that the credit risk of these users is very low and that we can access them at any time, right? And so what we do with these trusts is we create, if you like, a 
a structure, a solution, a financial solution that enables squaring the circle, that they continue to be reserves from the perspective of the, of the creditor countries, the owners of the SDR, but at the same time, they can be put to good use. And that requires a lot. It's a, it's a technically complicated uh, problem to solve. Huge thanks to our three panelists. I think that was extremely helpful and enlightening. And um, it was great to have you with us. And I'm sure it will have been much appreciated by the, by the whole audience. So many thanks to Laura um, for kicking off so well. Um, huge thanks to Jeremy for making time to do this and to engage in these debates. Also hugely appreciated. And particularly um, massive thanks to Minister Joubert um, in your incredibly busy time frame to make time for this. Um, but I think uh, certainly for me, it was very enlightening and I hope most of our audience will also have got a great deal out of that. Um, it's not a simple issue. There are a lot of technical details within it, um, but it is a really compelling issue at the moment for um, addressing the climate crisis, uh, green recovery from COVID-19, and the crisis of nature loss on a global scale as well. So let me just finish by um, thanking all our participants. We had some great questions in as well, but many thanks to all of you for contributing to, uh, to the, the session. And also huge thanks to our IIED team working behind the scenes. We will share a link to the recorded session soon on our website and by email to all of the participants. So many thanks indeed, and I think at this point we can wrap up. But thank you all very much. Thank you.